So, Steve, you've actually experienced some of these tech talent lawsuits before when you worked at Cisco and when you worked at LinkedIn. What are these lawsuits really about? Well, you know, for it to get to the point where it's actually a lawsuit that hits the court, it's usually followed a lot of communications and a lot of attempts for the two companies to work something out. So clearly there is a massive disagreement for it to get to this point. And for Jawbone to actually take this action, which is pretty serious because it sends a message not just to the market and to Fitbit employees, but also to their own employees that, hey, if you're going to go to a competitor, it's going to get serious. And what's particularly interesting in this case, I find, is that they're not at this point going after the individuals who seem to have uh, are being accused of taking the information. They're actually going after Fitbit directly. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Katie, what do you make of that and sort of the history between Jawbone and Fitbit? Like, we all know that Samsung and Apple hate each other and also work together, right? So what's the relationship with these guys? Well, they really are just pure rivals. And I think that both of these companies are under the gun. You have Samsung Gear coming out, Apple Watch coming out, Android doing a lot of innovative, thing with, innovative things with software and watches as well. So the question is, will any of us be wearing fitness tracking wearables in the future? So. Fitbit wants to have its IPO very quickly, come out, come out strong, show that they're profitable. I believe they make 41 cents a share if you look at their prospectus. And that would be great for them. This could actually derail the IPO or delay the IPO. Really? And then you will see both, you know, you'll see that company's financials, possibly that growth start to decline as people wear things like the Fitbit tracker or the Jawbone up less and less. Mm. So, Steve, is that the goal, like, to derail the IPO? Is that Jawbone's main attempt here? Well, what we would tell our employees, this has happened to me twice in my career, once at Cisco when Alcatel sued us, and then another time when I was at LinkedIn, and we hired several hundred people out of Yahoo, and we got a, a very stern letter from their legal counsel. Um, what, what I think it tells you is that, um, and, and if you're the recipient of those letters, you actually can talk to your employees and say, look, this is a desperate move, I think, from a desperate player. Um, and they're not necessarily saying you're taking our best employees. They're saying, hey, you're systematically trying to take information. And I don't know how they get the word plunder out of around six hires. Because if I look on LinkedIn, very simply, I could see that there have been a lot more people leaving um, jawbone to go to Apple and Google necessarily than they are to go to Fitbit. So it's a pretty aggressive play. That's a really good point. Uh, only six people using the word plunder. I mean, Katie, what, what do you make of that sort of desperation, really, with what Steve's talking about? Well, some people do wonder if Jawbone is desperate right now. They did just take a big, you know, $300 million investment from BlackRock, which should help them get a lot of things on track in terms of the way they put their products together and to help them become profitable. But it wasn't a straight-up equity investment. It was actually a convertible loan. And so because it's a loan, there are a lot more, you know, there's a lot of structure around it, and BlackRock has a big say in how Jawbone operates. And people wonder, would a company take that kind of deal if they were in great condition? Why wouldn't they just take more equity? Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and the irony, though, is that Jawbone's supposed to be a pretty good place to work, right? I mean, sure. is that the deal? It's not a terrible place. People don't hate it. They don't want to leave. No, I think it's, I mean, it's a Silicon Valley company, so it probably has all of the perks with a great startup, including, you know, free food and a really cool office and interesting and motivated colleagues. So you do, you know, but, but the company overall, I think people say, well, it's been going since 1999. They still haven't had an IPO. They've raised $700 million in that ballpark in funding. Where's their IPO? Where's their exit? And why aren't they profitable? Hence the pressure. Uh, hey, Steve, what can be the backlash for these kind of suits, say, on uh, the companies like a Jawbone who bring them? Sure. So, you know, Alex, it's, there's no doubt it's still a real huge war for talent out here in the Valley, and it has been for the last five years, and it's, it's super white hot. And I think what's really interesting is an organization, to get to this point, usually you want to focus on, I want to be a great place where people want to stay and not want to leave. And now you've taken this really aggressive position. I think it does show a bit of a vulnerability that Jawbone may be feeling right now because you don't want to get to that point where your employees are now. See, the, the ripple effect inside Jawbone right now is that they're going to have to clamp down on what information is shared with whom and the creative idea flow is going to be hampered. That's a big concern I've got if I'm an investor looking at Jawbone. Like if they're really worried about people leaving, now they're going to be really worried about intelligence leaking and all kinds of draconian lockdown, password protected stuff is going to start happening. That's not the kind of culture people want to work for in the Valley. And I think Jawbone's got some challenges in front of it.